It's important to remember that Katharine Hepburn did not set out to collect her performance clothes, nor would she have been able to do so during her early years in Hollywood. Almost without exception, the clothes worn in a film were returned to the studio's wardrobe stock to be repurposed, more than once, in other films. This raises the question about what Hepburn kept, how she acquired it, and why. She told Louis Botto in a mid-1970s interview that she'd never purchased anything, that occasionally she had been given something. The earliest film in the exhibition is from the 1935 RKO film, The Little Minister, designed by Walter Plunkett. This costume illustrates two very important aspects of a film designer's work. First, supporting the characterization to help tell the story, and secondly, knowing the technical aspects of filming. In this example, Catherine Hepburn was playing a Scottish aristocrat masquerading as a gypsy. The film was being shot in black and white. Plunkett had to pay close attention to the hue, the saturation, and the grayscale of each fabric he used so that the detail of the costume would be seen on the black and white film. At the same time, he had to make Catherine Hepburn feel like a gypsy. The bright red petticoat, not seen on film, helped to communicate gypsy to the actress. Muriel King designed the costumes for the 1937 RKO film, Stage Door. This is the dress worn for the Calla Lily speech, a reference, by the way, to a line from the 1933 stage play, The Lake. The dress appears to be white on the screen and is another example of the technical aspects of black and white film. Bright white fluoresces on black and white film, so in order to make the dress look white on screen, Muriel King chose a soft gray silk marquisette. This dress is described in the October 1937 issue of Photoplay, where Gwen Walters writes that a call from the actress had King swooping through the air to design her clothes. It describes this dress as layers of rounded petals of gray marquisette with a wide belt of magenta suede buttoned in front. Catherine Hepburn was known in her family for having lovely lingerie. Her nieces loved to rifle through her suitcases. This gown, worn in State of the Union, is very similar to others in the collection that were most probably for her personal use. It's made of a cream-colored silk georgette and crepe de chine with appliqued leaves. There are signs of wear beyond that required for a single scene in the film, so it may be that it became part of her personal wardrobe. The lobby card for the film illustrates the common practice in studio PR departments of coloring costumes on publicity materials without regard for the actual color of the garment, but rather with the intent to catch the eye of a passerby. For example, this nightgown is shown in different colors in different printed materials. In 1949, George Cukor directed the Tracy Hepburn film, Adam's Rib, about a husband and wife legal team arguing opposite sides of an attempted murder case. Let's listen to what Katherine Hepburn has to say about Walter Plunkett designing the costumes for Adam's Rib. And when in Adam's Rib we had a problem at Metro, uh, I think Mamboche had been going to do the clothes for Adam's Rib, and the price was so high that I just thought it was madness, and uh, the studio did which was more important than anything. And I said, well, let Walter do them. And Walter did a marvelous job on that. This amazing black silk evening dress highlighted Hepburn's 20-inch waist with bodice and hip draping that added volume to her slender figure. In 1956, Catherine Hepburn was approached by an English production company to do a film similar in subject to the 30s Garbo film, Ninochka. This was to be a comedy co-starring Bob Hope and was titled The Iron Petticoat. During the pre-production, Hepburn received preliminary sketches for her costumes and wrote back, quote, Getting out of the plane and when you first see her, I visualize a very bulky used jacket, an interesting costume, which could make him not know if she's male or female. A helmet, gloves, long coat, coveralls. 
but with personal touches to give individuality. She would never fly in what you sent me, unquote. Since Howard Hughes had taught her to fly, she did know what the costume should do. She also commented, quote, I don't know what film you're using, but dark colors are unstable on Eastman and not too flattering for me, unquote. This is another indication that she knew every aspect of her craft. Oliver Messel had Catherine Hepburn's costumes for Suddenly Last Summer made by the London couturier Norman Hartnell. Hepburn's niece, Catherine Houghton, told me that if her aunt liked a certain costume, she would have it duplicated for her own wardrobe. This brown silk Shantung ensemble has a Hartnell label and is line for line the same as the ensemble seen in the still from the film. The design group of Margaret Harris, Sophie Harris Devine, and Elizabeth Montgomery was known as Motley. Sophie Devine did these costumes for the Sidney Lumet film version of Eugene O'Neill's autobiographical play, A Long Day's Journey Into Night. She subtly underscored the Irish heritage of the family by making one of the costumes out of Irish linen with Irish crocheted lace. These costumes were worn for publicity for the last of the Tracy Hepburn films, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Spencer Tracy died just 15 days after shooting his last scene. Hepburn's niece, Catherine Houghton, played the daughter in the film, opposite Sidney Portier. This ensemble, used in publicity shots, shows signs of wear beyond a single photography session. Both are very much what Catherine Hepburn wore as a matter of personal taste, as well as public image. After Spencer Tracy died, Catherine Hepburn threw herself back into work. She had essentially suspended her career for five years to care for Tracy. Margaret First was the designer on The Lion in Winter, and two years later, referring back to the film, she wrote to Hepburn, Thank you again for the lovely trips we took, and for all your help and all the fun we had on the picture. It seems to me, looking back, that you dreamed up half the ideas for your costumes and then took me on cultural tours. A fine way to be a designer on a film. Unquote. The similar robe worn in the film is a light gray, but Catherine Hepburn had this eastern Saudi Arabian robe and a black one just like it in her personal collection. Margaret first wrote to Catherine Hepburn upon hearing that they would work together again in the 1972 film of A Delicate Balance. She wrote, I called you on Sunday just to say hello and that I'm so glad you are coming back and that we're going to be involved again in the costume lark. They tell me you're doing all the work for me. I'm so glad because I don't think I know how to do them and will gladly share a screen credit with you. First may have been referring to the leopard print caftan and jumpsuit. They were made in New York at Bergdorf Goodman. Once Hepburn had control over the script she accepted, she sought subjects with some social significance. This was especially true in her late career, and it was so in the case of the ultimate solution of Grace Quigley. In this film, the topic was a comedic take on the serious subject of euthanasia. With Nick Nolte as a hitman, Grace Quigley sets out to end the misery of old people who no longer find life worth living. Of course, life itself intervened. Designer Ruth Morley said that making Catherine Hepburn seem like a washed-out, down, seedy old lady was one of the hardest things she had ever done. Filmed on the streets of New York, Peter Kaplan wrote in the New York Times that Hepburn was watching the shooting, sitting in the rear of a long hearse. She sat as she had been photographed sitting for the 50 years of her movie stardom, in a kind of boyish squat, hugging her knees, her feet tucked under her. She wore tan trousers, a blue shirt, buttoned to her neck, a red scarf, and a beat-up coat. <laughs> 